Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Philpon and um, uh, Smith nephew, for allowing me to be here. Um, Perfect. So, um, for this now, uh, no significant disclosures for, disclosures for this talk. What my goal overall to do today is to basically, uh, now that we've gotten out of the clinic, let's get into the OR, let's get comfortable, let's make it more fun, let's make it reproducible. Uh, the first step is to have a good relationship with your anesthesiologist. They're going to help you immensely in getting everything started. I went through all the different iterations of different blocks, from fascia iliaca to lumbar plexus to everything else. By far the most reproducible for every different anesthesiologist that you're going to work for or with uh, is going to be your spinal. Your spinal provides two things for you. The first is it's going to provide a lot of relaxation, but also it's going to help the patient after the surgery. Uh, I typically put Doromorph in that spinal. It results in a little bit of itching, maybe a little bit of nausea, but usually for at least 12 to 20 hours, it can help with some of the pain. I really recommend if you're working with young adolescent females, these can be, you know, patients that have a lot of difficulty with pain in the very early phases. An epidural can be very helpful because you can keep it on longer if you need it. Uh, always general anesthesia is used. Patients are intubated. You have to be able to fully paralyze the patient. Uh, for me, I use a very heavy dose of paralytic agent, rocuronium. This is a dose that a lot of your anesthesiologists at first aren't going to be comfortable with. It's 1.5 milligrams to 2 milligrams per kilogram. That's a pretty high dose. That's very, very helpful, but uh, once you start that, you're going to be in the OR for a little bit, okay? So just make sure that it's the right time. Uh, once you get started, get them positioned, everybody use some variation of a fracture table. The key principles for you, you want to get the feet well padded, okay? You need to get them positioned in your boot. You need the ankle positioned at about 90 degrees. Then you need it secured. The thing that you don't want is you do not want the foot to slip. If the foot slips at all, that's when you start getting issues with the skin, that's when you start getting bruising, that's when you can get ankle pain after surgery, uh, and more importantly, sometimes you can end up with an RSD or a nerve compression injury. Uh, this can be avoided if you really keep the foot pretty well insecured. The per perineal pad or uh, post, uh, I use basically a carbon fiber post uh, with the Bledsoe pad. Smith and Nephew has a pad as well. Uh, these are wonderful. Uh, they do two things. They help with your distraction of the joint, but also they protect your, your groin. Okay, so you always need to check the genitalia. I personally position all of my patients, I think, unless you have somebody that you really trust, like Penny, uh, very, very important. Um, uh, you need to make sure that you don't have any folds in the towel or anything that can result in a problem in that region because it's, it's hard to defend it later. The application of traction is a pretty straightforward process. Uh, basically, the first step is to provide or produce the axial traction. So I typically pull grossly on the bar. Uh, this leg is a little bit abducted, abducted at the time. And then I do the fine traction. I'm checking all this under C-arm to make sure that I get adequate distraction space that I need. If you have a tight hip that hasn't quite gone yet or popped, typically when you adduct it against that post, that's where that post helps you as well, that's when you'll sometimes get that pop and get that distraction that you need. The last step is to internally rotate the foot. Uh, when you do that, that doesn't really help with your traction. If anything, you might lose a little bit of space on your C-arm image. But what it does is it creates a little bit of space between the front of the ball and the front of the cup. That's your access point, so that does help you later. Uh, just be careful with young women, though. Sometimes you can overly internally rotate them. So it, there's a fine line between how much internal rotation you need. The next step is kind of marking out your portals. Um, for me, uh, the one that's the most reproducible is this anterior lateral portal. This is one that probably everybody uses. It's the easiest to find. Once the hip is distracted, you can feel a nice little dimple over the front margin of the greater trochanter. That's the one that everybody uses. The other ones from here, there's a lot of variation, and this is where it kind of, uh, a lot of different ways to skin a cat. For me, you mark the ASIS, there's really no business to be on the inner part of this. That's when you start getting into bad stuff. Uh, the only nerve that's really at risk is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So when you do this portal, uh, you just don't want to go too deep with your knife. You don't want to cause an injury to that region. For me, when I make my mid-anterior portal, there's typically a cleft between the tensor and the sartorius. That's just about the right spot. You want to be about six centimeters apart, at least for me. That way I avoid the arthroscopic handcuffs. My hands can move freely without crossing up. In general, you can make your mid-anterior portal around this region, or you can go a little bit more proximal. In general, the more proximal that you make your portal, the more likely you're going to come down perpendicular to your capsule. It just makes it a little bit easier. I'll show you a slide to show you that. Um, and then I typically will use a third portal. Uh, that's also very helpful to get anchors in place. 
once I have my portals marked, then what I do is I take it to the C-arm. I take a, a, a switch stick, just kind of lay it over the skin, and then I take a C-arm image. I want to make sure I'm in the right spot. If you're off by a centimeter, it really makes a huge difference for being able to move around the joint. So just make sure you're in the right spot. What I like to see is I want to see that uh, switch stick come in parallel to the roof of the acetabulum. It's just about the perfect spot. Next step, uh, I make my incisions, then I put in my needle, okay? Needle and guide wire technique under C-arm is probably by far the safest. In general, this is a little misleading. Typically, you know, you can see here I'm about midway between the cup and the ball. This is a lot of distraction in this joint, so pretty easy one to get into. A lot of times you'd think you'd want to aim for the center, but because you're coming in a little bit posterior superior, actually you're going to come a little closer through here. And then it's a feel thing, okay? You want to feel a nice gentle pop through the capsule. If you're having to wrench it through, you're probably going through the labrum. If you don't like the feel of that, just back it out and start it again. You'd rather change your needle than kind of put a trocar through the labrum. Typically, you need to angle down just a little bit to be able to get in. Once the needle's in, you remove the stylet. This is when you get that vacuum whoosh. Okay, that means you're in, this, in the right spot. Aspirate before placing the wire. You're frequently going to have some blood or joint fluid or something inside of the joint. If you get rid of it in the beginning, this is the easiest time to get rid of it. Uh, then place your guide wire down. Visualize this under C-arm again. The thing you don't want to do is you don't want to start your case by breaking a wire. That's a big bummer. Uh, that's a real stressful way to start your day. So the keys for that are visualize it. Make sure your guide wire is straight. Make sure it's not bent uh, inside of the joint. Next step, put the trocar down. Once you get down to the capsule, take another image. Make sure you haven't bent or torqued your wire because you can adjust it at this time. And then when you're all done and when you're finally in, take out the guide wire and the trocar together. You won't shear the wire as you're pulling it out. So those are just nice little tricks to stay out of trouble in the beginning. Once you get the mid-anterior portal, the way you need to get this is you're viewing from the back, you're looking towards the front. The thing you want to see is you want to see this triangle formed by the ball, or the femoral head, and the labrum. This is the spot that you're kind of aiming for. This is a great one. This is a huge spot to aim for. The key for me, again, by making my portal just a little bit more proximal, I'm coming straight down. There's very minimal sky. This is very easy to come through. The more distal you make it, that's a little bit more advanced portal because when you're coming down through there now, even though this is a big space, functionally, you have a small area to come through. And a lot of times you can ride up the capsule and keep missing it, even though it looks like you're right in line. So that, that's helpful. Other step, stay dry. You know, I think a lot of people when we do these labs, they get their first portal, they want to put some fluid in because you're excited, you're in the joint. That's the only way you can see, right? Well, if you stay dry, you're not going to mix blood into that fluid and create an opa opaque field where you can't see the front. So just stay dry for the first step. That'll help you a ton. If you can't see this triangle, what went wrong? Well, maybe you went through the labrum. That's really going to impair your ability to view that front. Other thing, this might just be a tight joint. Maybe you need a little bit more relaxation. Is there fluid in the joint? A lot of blood. That makes it hard. Uh, a very large pincer or retroverted area, that's going to make for a very narrow window. Or in this case, you could see a massively hypertrophic degenerative torn labrum that's just closed down our field of view, <laughs> something that's actually smaller than the needle. So if you get in this situation or if the mid-anterior portal stresses you out, highly consider using the cross track. It's a great instrument, very reproducible, can make your first few hip scopes uh, much easier. Another step is you see, you know, when you watch Dr. Philippine, a lot of guys are moving back and forth between these portals. It looks easy, right? Well, it's about six to eight centimeters of soft tissue. There are a lot of different paths that you can create. Use a slotted cannula in the beginning. Condition that portal. Once this is a path of least resistance, then you can easily go back and forth. It makes it a lot easier on you as you move forward. I use a third portal all the time. Uh, it's, I, I, I do it at the end of the case, kind of localize it with my needle to make sure I'm in a good spot. But the key thing with it is you can see we come down in a perfect spot on the cup. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to get a perfect anchor position so that you don't evert your labrum with your repair and also so you don't break into or out of the joint. It also makes knot tying very, very nice because there's no tying around a capsule or any weird direction. You can really get a nice solid knot. The capsulotomy, uh, this is a, a, a hard thing to do in the very beginning, and I struggled this when I started with Dr. Philippon. The key is the beaver blade is a very, very dangerous piece of equipment. You always have to have the tip visualized. If you lose visualization of the beaver blade, chances are you're going to create a full thickness cartilage lesion within a couple seconds. So always have the tip in view. I would encourage you also not to just connect your two portals. A lot of times, if you look at where you come through from your mid-anterior portal, it's awful close to the labrum. If you just connect the two, you're not going to leave a medial sleeve of capsule. This hurts you when you try and work in the peripheral compartment, and it makes it virtually impossible for you to close your capsule. 
So if you can, what you want to do is you want to start in the back. So I'm looking from front to back. You do the back. Now you put your camera back through, you're going to be able to move it around a lot more. You're going to be able to see a lot more. Then what you want to do is you want to get your cutting instrument from the portal where you started over here to the capsulotomy to cut away. You want to cut away from the labrum. That way you'll preserve more capsule. This gives you the ability to move around, do more advanced arthroscopic procedures on the central compartment. You only want to take what you need, though, because you do need this capsule for the peripheral compartment. It's absolutely counterintuitive, but you really, really need it. When you get into the peripheral compartment, we all do knee and shoulder scopes, so we think, well, the camera can't bump into anything. Divorce yourself from that thought. Your camera is a retractor, okay? You need to get your camera under the capsule, lift it up so you can work underneath it. This is how you create that big view that you see with Dr. Philpon that makes the peripheral compartment look easy. Also, preserving your capsule, that fluid will distend that capsule, create a big environment for you to be able to work. Once you get in, a lot of mistakes that people make when they're in the lab is that I've got two instruments in the peripheral compartment, I'm going to start burring. That's when you get into trouble because you don't know exactly where you are. Okay? You've got to get your big view. You need to get the medial synovial fold or the ligament of Weibrecht. You need to be able to see that. That's 6 o'clock or the bottom. You don't have to resect past that. Thankfully, it's hard to get past that. You want to see the vessels. Also hard to burr to as well, but you want to know where they are. So now you have 12 and 6 o'clock. You know where to work in between. Once you visualize the labrum, typically the neck will show you where the impingement's occurring in 100% of cases. So now you have a good game plan. It's safer. You're less likely to dig a hole. Uh, for the femoral osteoplasty, you flex the hip. This lifts up the capsule. Now you can get underneath it. Your assistant, very important, hand on the knee at all times, a steady hand, okay? They can't be moving around. They can't be talking about the football game this weekend. They need to be focused. As long as they do that for you, that's going to protect your cartilage because your ball is now inside of the cup. That's a huge advantage of doing this because now you know where you're supposed to be working. If you do an open surgical hip dislocation, it's hard to know where to do the femoral osteoplasty. All the guides are there for you when you do it this way. The more you flex the hip, the more you work inferiorly. The more you extend the hip, the more you work superiorly. So you're constantly moving in and out of flexion and extension to get the entire neck because you don't want to leave a big cobblestone or rock or bump behind because that's only going to hurt whatever you do in the, inter in, or, or in the central compartment. Shooting x-rays. This is a sculpture. Okay, The one rule with sculpture is once you've resected too much, you can't put it back. Take your time. Take x-rays. The x-rays are only going to give you a few, plane of your femoral osteoplast few planes of your femoral osteoplasty, but they're good guides for how much you've resected. A lot of times with a severe cam, you'll, you're going to think you've done more than you've done. So it's good to get an x-ray. The technique for this, flex the hip up. You abduct or abduct it a little bit, I'm sorry, uh, and externally rotate a little bit. And then you can get a nice lateral view. You just need to put a little bit of cant on your C-arm. Dr. Larson's paper is an excellent resource for this if you have any questions. And he can really help you get good x-rays in the OR. Central compartment, we're going to go through this throughout this conference. But once you get in there, you need a game plan. Labrum, repairable or not, reconstruction or not, cartilage, you have to do anything with that, you have to shave it, you have to do a microfracture, uh, working on the rim, how much of a pincer do you have. Once you're done with the procedure, game ready is very helpful, patients love it, they typically are sad when it goes away about a week later because it does help quite a bit. Uh, I use a Foley catheter, I used to have a lot of issues with urinary retention, especially in men above 40. Keeping a Foley in until the next morning really helps with that. Uh, and you'd be surprised how much fluid extravasation you get from a hip arthroscopy. Uh, SCD is very helpful. Incidence of DVT, uh, very, very low. Um, uh, usually we're just using aspirin, things like that. But I think using some type of mechanical prophylaxis during the procedure is safer for the patients, and it's really no big deal uh, for them to wear that. I use a positioning kit of some sort to keep patients on anterior hip precautions to protect the capsular closure or repair after the procedure for about two weeks. 23 observation, I think that this is a real orthopedic procedure hidden or masked by the fact that it's arthroscopic. I really think that we should keep these patients in the hospital to make sure that they do okay. You'd be surprised how many people stay to a second day when you really have rigid criteria as to what they should be discharged for. Thank you very much.